Okay, so this is the first um, in a um, series of videos on Romanticism, the period of Romanticism and um, some of the concepts that go along with it and, and, and um, some of the authors um, that we associate with Romanticism. So in this first one, we want to take a look at um, some uh, aspects of definition. Um, what, what does that mean, romantic um, romanticism? Uh, where does the term come from? Now, first of all, uh, that is a term that comes from um, something that is associated similar to um, romance, the, the, the um, tradition of romance writing from, from medieval times, which we have already encountered in the context of novel writing. Um, right, the, the 18th century saw its a development of a realist novel as something that that is to be differentiated from uh, from romance writing. So romance writing didn't have um, quite such a good name, and this is something um, to remember that uh, in the English-speaking context, um, the Romantics did not call themselves Romantics. It's not a term that they would have applied to themselves, uh, which is a little bit different to the German context, where some Romantic writers would have called themselves Romantic. So here uh, in English, in, in, in English uh, the term still has a largely a negative meaning. Uh, we can go back to um, Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of English Language, um, which I talked about um, in another video um, from 1755, and look at his um, definitions um, of the term romantic, <clears throat> where it says re resembling the tales of romances, this is the ancestry, also wild, um, right? This was the this this allegation of uh, improbability of wildness of of the romances. So therefore, also improbable or false. And here we can see sort of very clearly that this is still a, a, a rather negative um, thing. That something that is romantic is is wild, impractical, impractical, or even false. Um, but also. Um, fanciful and full of wild scenery. So we, we, we can see some some of the things that will emerge, uh, but we can also see that that mainly this is a negative um, definition. And if we look um, roughly 100 years later into the um, the Oxford um, English Dictionary from 1854, um, they're quoting uh, for the use of romantic um, this sentence, a romantic scheme is one which is wild, impractical, and yet contains something which captivates the fancy. So in, this, um, in, in 1854, um, by a time that, that romantic, uh, romanticism has already happened, uh, we can see that there is still sort of this, this negativity of impractical wild, um, but at least the, um, uh, the acknowledgement there is something in there which captivates um, the fancy. And in fact, there are um, endless debut, uh, disputes uh, about defining the period, about defining what romanticism is, um, and and what what makes something um, romantic. So there is of of course also this um, hermeneutic circle of the typical romantic elements. So what are typical romantic elements? Um, they are those elements that are to be found in a, in a romantic poet uh, and poem. Um, and whatever you find in a romantic poem will be a typical romantic element. Um, so this is a little bit of a danger uh, danger here. Um, because in, on the one hand, it is just literature that is written in a certain period, and we'll talk about the time frame. Um, but more importantly, it, it is literature that is characterized by certain um, general features, by certain aspects that that differentiate it um, from others. So, so this is always what I'm trying to stress here in these these lectures: how the writing of one period um, differs markedly uh, and, and does something new, does something extraordinary, breaks with some conventions, establishes new conventions. So we're going to take a look at what are the things that that make romanticism so specific, what is romantic in that sense. And in order to do, to do that, um, it, uh, it might help to take first uh, to first take a look at a painting. And since we are in Greifswald, this has to be, of course, a, a painting by um, Caspar David Friedrich. So this um, should be an image that you're hopefully already um, familiar with. Um, this is Caspar David Friedrich's uh, Wanderer Above the sea, um, sea of Fog from 18. 
18 and we, we want I, I want to briefly look at that image again and look at some of the oddities um, of of this um, this very iconic um, image so um, first of all in terms of genre we can note that it's um, it's not a fuzzy or a hybrid um, between different um, painterly genres it is it is not um, strictly speaking a landscape painting <clears throat> because if it were a landscape painting then um, that guy uh, would sort of be in the way um, if you want to look at the landscape you don't have someone in, in, in front of you but it is also not a portrait painting because for a portrait painting we would expect the, the man to to face us so we could actually see see him so why why do we have these these two aspects of the landscape um, and the figure that is in the way but that is also not looking at us and of course what that means is that one of the things that the, the painting is all about is the act of perception what we are seeing is someone looking at something right we are in the same position or roughly in the same position as the person who is who is looking and we are we are made aware of the fact that this person is is, is looking at something um, but what is being perceived or what what is uh, what is the thing that this person sees and and this ties back to uh, what I have sketched in in this uh, in the video on the aesthetic revolution because what that is is of course an experience of the sublime of the sublime in nature we have um, we have these these um, ragged forms here if you look at these these are irregularly shaped um, these are um, uh, vast um, they're seemingly no ordering um, principle also note that um, the um, there's this elevated position um, we see that the, the, the wanderer is 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 up there on a mountain um, is right there on the uh, on the highest point of the mountain and it's even higher than our own perspective um, because he's he's actually seeing something from f further up than, than than we are so he might actually be seeing something that we we can't see so this elevated position is of course both domineering and also endangering we were, were kind of um, we kind of want to want to tell him don't don't step further you're gonna you're gonna fall down so there is also this 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 danger in in, in the aspect now what he's looking at is the fog and the the fog is um so why didn't i mean we can ask why didn't the painter wait for the fog to lift so you could actually properly see the landscape but that of course is the very point that the fog by partially concealing the landscape makes it more interesting makes it more mysterious because we can't see everything and that again uh, is a characteristic a prime characteristic of the sublime the obscurity the partial obscurity that's something that you can't see uh, in its in its full clearness uh, is is that so the fog adds to the landscape by by obscuring it um, there's also importantly the opening of the perspective towards the sky right we see um, part of the sky here uh, but also characteristic is um, that there is no clear horizontal line so what I'm what I'm showing here is exactly what we don't get we get this kind of blurring of the perspective upwards and outwards in a sense that there is no no clear horizontal zone, uh, zone um, line sorry and finally <clears throat> if we're looking um, get another color here if we're looking here we can notice something uh, interesting that the fog isn't just there uh, but the fog is almost seems to be illuminated it's colored because what we see here is is the sunrise so the sun which we can't see it's, uh, itself but we can see it um, shining on the fog and and brightening the fog and illuminating the fog and giving it a certain kind of uh, of light um, so all of these are uh, all of these ex uh, aspects are important to the kind of experience that this transports we can look to an, an even more famous uh, image uh, of, of Friedrich and, and basically see the same aspects. We see um, the we see the people um, who are not looking at us but lo are looking at the scenery. Uh, we see the sublime landscape, um, the the irregular shapes. 
we see um, how um, the horizontal line is blurred, um, how the, 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 the view um, is, is sort of elevating us. We see the, the elevated position from which we're looking down. So this is really something, this isn't, um, uh, this isn't sort of by chance, but it's a very intentional creation of um, this, this scene. And, and all of these aspects um, that I've sketched are, are really interrelated to each other. So the scene would be inexistent in the sense of meaningless without someone perceiving it. This is a moment in time that only exists because it is being perceived. Um, the scene would, of course, be less interesting without the fog concealing at least some of it. Uh, and the fog would be less effective in this without um, someone illuminating um, or something illuminating or coloring it. So I would argue that um, what the painting depicts um, is what we could call an aesthetic experience of transcendence, an experience of transcendence, of something that is vast, grand, sublime, transcendent, but it cannot but foreground the subjectivity and limitation of it. So it is an experience of transcendence, but only in that very moment and only for that, that very person looking. Um, and, and, and it might be gone as soon as it, as it is perceived. So it's not something that is easily graspable and easily put down um, in, 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 in images or in words um, and so on. So this is, this is very important. I think this is sort of a core thing of already um, romantic experience, something that is transcendent, but also tied and therefore limited to subjectivity in, in, in many respects. Now, you might very well ask yourself, um, hey, I thought this was the introduction to English literature, so why is he talking about this German um, painter? Uh, but the reason for this is because this image um, chimes so well with one of the, um, the most um, well-known moments of um, <clears throat> romantic experience in, in a text, in one of the core texts um, of, of English Romanticism. And that is um, a poem by William Wordsworth called The Prelude. And it's, it's more than just a poem. It's really um, an autobiography in poetic form. Um, Wordsworth wrote um, for all of his life about this. And what he was trying to do was um, to sketch, as the subtitle says, the growth of a poet's mind. So it's very much an, an interior um, poem of, um, of self-reflection, of trying to, to, to find out what forms our minds and what kinds of experience um, do that. And in order to do that, at one point, um, Wordsworth tells about uh, a trek up Mount Snowden, um, which you can see here, in, um, from 1791. So the largest um, mountain in, in, in Wales. And um, he, um, what he wants to do is he wants to do, he basically books a sunrise tour. You can still do that. Um, so they would walk up in the night um, to the top so that when, they, when they're at the top, um, when they reach the top, the sun would rise and then they can watch the, the sunrise from up there. And this is what they do. Um, and he describes this, how he, how they're walking up through, through the darkness, of course, they're following a guide and he's basically focused on, on, on where he's, where he's stepping. So this is this description here with forehead bent earthward, earthward, as if in opposition set against an enemy, I panted up with eager pace and no less eager thoughts. He's already looking forward to that, but he's fully concentrated on, on the track. When at my feet the ground appeared to brighten, and with a step or two seemed brighter still, nor was time given to ask or learn the cause, for instantly a light upon the turf fell like a flash, and lo, as I looked up, the moon hung naked in a firmament of azure without cloud, and at my feet rested a silent sea of hoary mist. So what has happened is, as they, as they move up, um, they they come to the, the the top of the the fog, the top of the cloud, and they move out above the cloud, and then the, the moon becomes visible and shines down on this um, this sea of of, of uh, mist, uh, this the sea of clouds. And, and Wordsworth goes on to to describe the scene: a hundred hills, their dusky beaks upheaved, all over this still ocean. This is the the fog, and beyond. 
Far, far beyond, the solid vapors stretched in headlands, tongues, and promontory shapes into the main Atlantic that appeared to dwindle and give up his majesty usurped upon far as the sight could reach. Not so the ethereal vault. Encroachment none was there, nor loss. Only the inferior stars had disappeared or shed a fainter light in the clear presence of the full moon or a full orb moon sorry so what we can see here is a very very similar experience to the image in in, in Caspar David Friedrich we have um, we have the focus on perception on what is being what is being seen on momentary perception we have um, the the partial obscurity that is provided by the fog that is that is being looked uh, on um, and also the effect of uh, the influence of lighting in this case it's the moonlight that that illumines um, the fog and makes it makes it come alive and, and in, in Kaspar Friedrich it's the early it's the early uh, morning sun um, and in the poem um, we can also see that um, that this is intentional that this is meant to be a, a reflection on on perception um, that will Wordsworth. This is what Wordsworth always does in this in this poem. He he, he describes these these experiences, um, usually in nature, um, that that um, that impress him, and then he starts re reflecting on them. And then he starts thinking about okay, what does that mean? What is the what is the significance um, of this after after it's gone? So when into air had partially dissolved that vision given to spirits of the night and three chance human wanderers in calm thought reflected it appeared to me the type of a majestic intellect so now he he he, he thinks well, what what did that mean and he says this is this is almost like like the mind there i beheld the emblem of a mind that feeds upon eternity so the the mind is something that that feeds on this on exactly this, what I've called uh, an experience of, of transcendence, um, infinity, as he calls it here. And this is what we feel on. This is what we need. We need that kind of experience um, in order to make us uh, fully human in a, in a way. So this is the experience that that um, the, the wonder above the fog of sea of, of Caspar David Friedrich and, and Wordsworth and the prelude really share here. So it hopefully becomes clear that, that both of these passages illustrate uh, a number of key aspects in identifying Romanticism. And um, this is sort of the, uh, the, the easiest trick uh, that I can give you to, to, to grasping what Romanticism is um, are the two terms that, that will follow now. Um, and the first of these is, of course, nature. All of these experiences happen uh, and start out in in nature, and and um, I'm, I'm certainly aware that you <laughs> certainly uh, think that you are aware that 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 nature is um, an, an aspect that that comes up in in discussions of romanticism. Now, obviously, nature isn't something new. Nature existed before romanticism, um, but it the the meaning uh, of nature, uh, the conception of what nature means, um, and and what 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 it signifies is something that uh, I want to argue fundamentally changes from neoclassicism to romanticism. So when we look at neoclassical re uh, nature, um, remember that that nature was basically an expression of order. Um, that's, this, um, this was the idea that, that nature basically means the ordered cosmos um, and an order that reflects beauty uh, and also moral truth. So nature is truth. And that truth is objectively given. You, nature is there. Um, it, um, it might be mysterious, but only because we haven't understood it completely. So in the end, nature is sort of open once the light of, uh, of the Enlightenment illuminates it it's completely. Um, so the knowability means that um, once the light is, is everywhere, then everything will be unchanging. Um, so look at this this passage here um, from from Pope's essay on criticism, so core document of of neoclassicism, um, where he talks about um, poetic expression um, and says, but true expression, like the unchanging sun, clears and improves whatever it shines upon. It gilds all objects 
but it alters none. This is the ideal. The sun shows everything for what it actually is. It, it clears and improves whatever it shines upon, so we actually see it, uh, but it alters none. Um, because the truth is objectively true, whether not, I don't have a different truth than you have, right? This is the, the idea of, of objectivity. Now compare this to uh, a passage from uh, another poem by, by William Wordsworth, one of the, uh, his sonnets, where um, surprisingly he, um, he's in the city, um, usually he's, he's talking about nature, but here he's talking about the city uh, and describing the beauty of the city. And the, but the important aspect of this is that um, he's watching the city again early in the morning and the sun comes up. Um, and of course, as we know, whereas the midday sun is sort of a neutral kind of source of light, the morning sun and the evening sun is colored in a certain way. And, and he uses that to, to describe the scenery that he's looking at. And he says, the city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare, Ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. So remember, this is the early morning, the, the fires aren't up yet. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock or hill. So the city becomes beautiful because the sun colors it in a certain way. And this isn't objective. This is an, a momentary um, thing. The, the, the poem, um, the, the, the title of the poem is actually composed upon West Westminster Bridge on a certain date. Um, so it, it, it emphasizes the fact that this is a moment in time. And at that moment, the city appeared to be beautiful. And the sun had a very important part in that, in that it, it gives that, that kind of coloring. So that's, that's one of the differences that nature isn't something that is objectively there, um, but rather something that, that changes with perception, something that needs to be perceived subjectively. So instead of being merely a, a passive object for observation, nature actively um, provides insights, provides these glimpses of transcendence, provides these these uh, experiences of, of um, transcendence. Um, so nature in a way becomes more than in classicism um, in that it, it, it gives us something beyond that which is, which is merely um, uh, empirically given, but it also re it replaces the direct understanding of transcendence with intimation, with, with an, a more indirect um, way of, of knowing, of, of, of almost grasping something that is there, um, but it's, that's, that's hard to put, put down. And that's, that's, that's sort of problematic um, because this kind of insight is dependent, as we saw, on a perceiving agent. Um, it is only half active. It's always sort of a, a back and forth between the inspiration that nature gives and, and someone perceiving it and, and doing something with this. And this is why the perceiver is always part of, of the image. Um, but that also means that these experiences need to be transformed into thought. We saw that in, in, in Wordsworth, how first comes the experience, which is raw, which is just there, and that impresses his mind. But then he needs to actively, calmly think about that and turn that into thought. And then, of course, in a third step, he needs to turn that into, into art again. He needs to, to write it down. He needs to, to turn it into an image. Um, so the, the thought needs to be transformed into poetic language. And that's why nature is, is not enough to, to describe romanticism. It's the starting point and, and always say nature if someone asks you what, what is romantic, nature, but a specific kind of nature and a nature that is dependent on the observer and not just the observer in itself, but rather on a mental faculty, a mental capability of the observer, and that is the observer's imagination. So the fact that we have imagination, that we can form images um, actively and not just passively as sort of retrieving data means that we, for romantics, we are not just hard drives that, that um, consist solely of everything that has been put there. Remember this idea of the mind as a tabula rasa, as, as in a blank slate, and everything has to be put there and then can be worked on um, the, the data that, that needs to be um, coming through the senses. Romantics had a, a, a more 
um, dialogic understanding um, to say that yes we get impressions from from nature um, but they need to be formed uh, by actively formed by something that that is the imagination just look at this passage from uh, Percy B Shelley's uh, Mont Blanc a poem that describes um, the mountain but the mountain stands of course for an experience of the sublime again and he starts this with this this very uh, abstract reflection of how the mind works the everlasting universe of things flows through the mind and this is the this is sort of the stream of sense impressions that we have there is an, a universe of things and we we perceive it through our eyes through our senses and it flows therefore through its uh, through the mind uh, and rolls its rapid waves now dark now glittering now reflecting gloom now lending splendor where from secret springs the source of human thoughts its tribute brings of waters so there's this vast stream of data that kind of go through my mind but there are these tributary um, streams these smaller tributary streams that, that do something to that 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 act that add something to this experience um, a different way to put it uh, would be from uh, Wordsworth's uh, poem Tintern Abbey um, where he talks about all the mighty world of eye and ear both what they half create and what perceive so again we perceive something but we also half create it in the act of perception so imagination is an active force that gives shape and meaning to uh, whatever we 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 get from from nature as as kind of an experience and of course this is less something that is that is based on on rationality on reasoning but rather something that that is tied to um, to emotion emotion is 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 part particularly of this this original um, experience of of the sublime the transcendent the beautiful um, this is from Wordsworth um, famous preface to his uh, major collection lyrical ballads one of the founding documents of, of um, romanticism and the preface um, sets out some of the core ideas um, and and there Wordsworth says that um, all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings so you there, that you, there has to be sort of this initial spark um, usually triggered by an experience where we have this overflow of powerful feelings uh, and this is often quoted um, but of course it goes on um, and though this be true poems to which any value can be attached were never brought, produced on any variety of subject but by a man who being possessed of more than usual organic sensibility had also thought long and deeply so the orga organic sensibility we um, see here so this, this this aspect that the mind you have to have a mind that is open to this kind of experience in order to actually even recognize that something um, grand is, is happening but then you have to think long and deeply and a little bit later he says uh, i said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings but it takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility the emotion is contemplated till by a species of reaction the tranquility gradually disappears and an emotion kindred to that which was before the subject of contemplation is gradually produced and does itself actually exist in the mind in this uh, in this mood successful composition generally begins so this of course um, is the all-important step from this original emotion from the recollection of this emotion to the creation of art which is then um, communicable um, and then I can read the poem and, and have something similar um, uh, to this original experience that that of course is the point of of this kind of of poetry this kind of writing and this kind of painting to to recreate um, at least some of that experience in the minds of the, the recipients um, the romantics tried to come up with uh, numerous uh, images to explain this 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 uh, working of the mind think of of, of she Shelley who who talks about the the, the stream um, the river of, of of the universe of things um, another very um, uh, common and, and popular um, image was that of the Aeolian harp 
Um, now, an Aeolian harp um, or a wind harp is a musical instrument. It looks looks like this. That is played by the wind. So you, you basically just put it out there, and the wind will go across these strings um, and will create sounds. Um, named, of course, after Aeolius, um, the ancient Greek god of of the wind. Um, and um, and this was particularly apt for, um, as, a, as an emblem of, of how uh, the, the, poetics, uh, po uh, the poet's mind works, because um, without the wind, there would be no music. <clears throat> um, so the wind, of course, is the inspiration. This is nature. This is what nature gives us. But there needs to be something to give form, to give shape um, to that um, raw um, experience. And that's the Aeolian harp that turns then this this raw experience into music um, and this is how um, romantic poets conceived of themselves that they were these people who were open to these influences but who were also able to give shape to them um, and to turn them into poetry we see this for example here in in, in shelley's ode to the west wind um, where he asks the west wind um, itself make me thy lyre even as the forest is what if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone, sweet though in sadness. Be thou, spirit fears, my spirit. Be thou me, impetuous one. And this elevation of um, the imagination and of the sensibility of the poet um, certainly means that, that subjectivity becomes uh, a prime focus of um of romantic writing but also a prime problem um certainly because it is something that needs to be uh, investigated negotiated um the individual becomes central to romantic aesthetics and and um poetry um we've seen basically as one of the aspects of um this literary history how um the individual um becomes ever more important to um, to writing, to thinking, to creating culture. Um, we saw this on the um, emerging on the early modern stage and in early modern writing, this 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 playing out of roles, this investigation into individuality, um, but that was sort of still um, tentative. Um, we've seen it emerge in the um, more strongly in, in these sort of investigations in, in, in realist narratives um, when we're also getting closer to the subjectivity of characters uh, through these personal narrations like like in, in, in Pamela and in here finally we get uh, kind of to the apotheosis of of individuality as something that is not just um, roles to be uh, tried out or uh, belonging to a specific group of people to a specific class um, but but rather to um, to put individuality um, center and above everything else and said individuality is absolute i am only me and no one else no one else is is is, is like me really um, the most important forerunner for this romantic notion of individualism is, is probably Jean-Jacques Rousseau with his uh, Confessions, um, where he writes about what he's, what he's doing. I have entered upon a performance which, which is without example, whose accomplishment will have no imitator. I mean to present my fellow mortals with a man in all the integrity of nature, and this man shall be myself. I know my heart and have studied mankind. I am not made like anyone I have been acquainted with, perhaps like no one in existence. If not better, I at least claim originality. So this is kind of an, an, an individuality that, that, that says, I am like no one else, and this is only me. And, and romanticism really is, is the birth of this, this cult of absolute individuality that frankly is with us until today. Um, all notions of self-expression, of self-fulfillment, you have to become your true self, you, you have to find out who you really are. This is romantic. This is romantic individuality that says uh, there is only one true you, and that's because so that you can find something that 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 question that very question wouldn't have made sense to someone in the early modern age uh, and certainly not in in, in medieval age um, and this is of course in terms of literature also the, the the where the notion is born that the speaker of a poem is 
the poet. And we, if you read romantic poetry, you will see that uh, romantics did their best to, to, to actually create, to uphold this idea that uh, the speaker of the poem is actually the poet by, by saying, I wrote this on this day uh, at this specific moment in time and, and so on. But we should be um, we should be aware that that they were aware of the process of, of reception and communication that they they were really very self reflexive about this and that the romantic persona is really the result of a process of self creation not for nothing will be one of the first um, sort of rock star personas of, of um, literary history it comes out of romanticism in the form of, of Byron. And he creates a persona that people associated with himself, but that was really a fabrication um, and, and, and not the, the true kind of nature. But we'll look at that um, in a later video.